We've been in Philippians chapter 2. We've been talking about unity. And Phil, they were singing in unity. I love that. Sometimes I just stop singing and I just listen. Can you imagine heaven? The singing that will take place in heaven. And it won't be like we sing now. I think y'all sounded good. I think, I, I heard the cathedral say this one time. They said, y'all sound so good, y'all ought to get a bus and go on the road. Right? That's what I think y'all sounded like this morning. At least from where I was standing. But maybe your neighbor didn't sing that great. You know, and you're like, eh, you didn't hear this guy. Right? But in heaven, I think we'll all have a singing voice. It'll all be praise. And even if we don't have a singing voice, there won't be any critics. There won't be anybody there to say, eh, that was so-so, right? That's the ultimate when it comes to unity. And I think we ought to experience a taste of it at least in our churches today. We've been studying, we've, been, we've already seen the unity of Christ, we've already seen the unity of the Father, and then we saw last week Paul's unity exampled here for us. There's two more, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And I want to take both of them together today because I want you to see the relationship that Paul has with Timothy and Epaphroditus and with each other because that relationship is going to be important to us today. So he gives us five great examples of unity. Philippians has to be the best layout for unity amongst believers in all of Scripture. I mean, we've seen it that he just says we need it. And then he defined it. And then he shows us an example of it. And then he shows us four more examples of it right afterwards. So if you are willing and able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Now, I, I, was, I heard in the Bible study hour, I was in two different classes. They asked me to help teach a little piece of first and second grade. So that's the level that I'm normally at. And I thrive there. But I was also heard, you know, that, well, you know how some preachers, they only take one or two verses at a time. I think that was directed at me, but it may take us a while to get through Philippians, but not today. We're going to start in verse 19 and we're going to finish the chapter. So hang on. So we got to cover a lot of ground. But we need all of this together because that relationship between these three are important. Because of their relationship with the Father, it's important. So, so we want to take it all together. So verse 19, and God's word says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus <clears throat> to send Timothy to you soon. So that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Verse 22. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as, as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my needs. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because, <clears throat> because you heard that he was ill. Verse 27, indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him and that I may be blessed or be less anxious. 
Verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to com complete what was lacking in your service to me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today and I thank you for the message. I thank you for the relationship between Paul and Epaphroditus and Timothy and yourself that we see here. I thank you for the example of unity that we find here, Lord, but also the warnings that we see here. Lord, I pray as we study, as we complete our study on unity this morning, Lord, that you would help us to focus not just on your word, but on what it says to us and what it would have us to do differently. Lord, it's one thing to hear the word. It's another to apply it. Lord, and I pray that that would be our focus today, that we would look for the application in our life, what you would have us to do with your words this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you can be seated now. We can see in this passage <clears throat> that there are just multiple examples of unity. We see all through this study in, in unity for the past five weeks, this makes week number six, we can see that he's specifically talking to believers. If anyone in this world is going to have unity, it ought to be believers. So I want to look at the relationship between these three individuals and we're going to look at what brings unity in their life in their relationships. The first thing I want to look at is the relationship between Paul and Timothy. They had, first of all, a shared mission. And then in a moment, we'll look at Epaphroditus and Paul, and then we'll tie it all together. Now, they had a shared miss mission, and that was for the lost to make disciples, to serve Christ, and to spread the gospel. That's what verses 19 through 24 are talking about. They're talking about Paul and Timothy having the same mission. So that has unity wrapped all up in it because they had the same goal. Their goal was to share Christ. Their goal was to make disciples. If we all have the same goal, then we ought to at least a little bit experience unity, right? The Olympics are going on still. When do they finish up? Do they finish up this week? Anybody know? Is anybody watching? Okay, a couple people. <laughs> no, I think it ends this week, but if you watch the rowing, have you seen some of those competitions? It's amazing how fast they can get those boats, especially that long skinny boat that if, if you weren't careful, it'd just fall right over, right? Sometimes, some of those events, they have someone in the front. And that person, does he have an oar or she? They don't even have an oar. They're just calling out the cadence, right? To keep everyone rowing at the same pace. At the, their goal is the finish line, right? They're all going in the same direction. What if, what if I was in the boat, you know, and then all of a sudden they're all rowing this way and I'm rowing that way. I'm like, Whoa, wait, no, I want to turn and go this way. If I'm the only one rowing that way, <clears throat> well, let's see, if I have one oar, I'm going to turn us, right? If I have two oars, I'm just going to slow us down because they're going to overpower me. We're going to continue moving on towards the goal, but I'm going to slow us down. We're not going to be as effective as we can be because one person is going the opposite direction. We don't have the same mission. We don't have the same goal. I want to go back to the dock, right? Everybody else wants to go to the finish line. Now, how about church? How's that work with church? If our goal is to make disciples, if, if that's our goal, and we're all heading in the same direction, what if one person with two oars starts going the other way? Will we stop making disciples? No. But we won't be as effective, will we? 
It won't happen that way. We won't be as effective. What if somebody with one oar starts going the opposite direction? Now it's going to turn us, right? That's how we get to churches that practice consumer Christianity. That's how we get to churches that are all about entertainment and not worship. Not service. Not serving their Lord and King. Because somewhere along the line, one person started rowing the other way. And then their doctrine changes. And then everything changes. And then they start seeing scriptures. Well, but today. No, this doesn't change because we change this does not change because we redefine what the the word woman means it doesn't change this stands true no matter what culture does but when one person starts rowing the opposite direction and then a few other people fall in sync then pretty soon you have a church that's as far away from this as they can get right because they've turned the ship They turned it away from, let's base everything we do, say, teach, preach on God's word. And now all of a sudden, they base it all on, what do you want to hear? What if I just put out a poll and say, what do y'all want me to preach on when we finish Philippians? I know what you'd all say, Jude, maybe that won't take them a year right I bet you I could make it don't don't start with me right what if I did that what if I just said well what do y'all want to do everybody's going to have a different opinion right and then pretty soon we're not following God's lead we're following man's lead we're following what we would prefer you know I love studying revelation and that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to this semester of Faith Bible Institute because it's such a good study and We have to read the entire book. That's part of our homework. And what does that book say about reading that book? That you'll be blessed. So I don't know how I'm going to be blessed. But the whole time we're in Faith Bible Institute this semester and reading Revelation, I'm going to buy a lottery ticket every day. I'm just going to test you, God. (laughs) I don't think he works that way. I don't know how he blesses us, but sometimes it's the shoes on our feet don't wear out when they ought to. It's the car makes it 300,000 miles. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's straight spiritual, right? We don't know how he's going to bless us, but we know that he says he will. If we're all going the same direction, we would be as, as efficient as a church as we can be. And that's what Paul's been talking about. I've been talking about what Paul said for six weeks. I don't think it took him six weeks to talk about unity. But can you imagine a church that's in total unity that everyone sees the goal is to make disciples? Because time is short. When we study Revelation, it's going to be time is short, time is short, time is short. Because we see the signs of the times. It says the very earth will groan. Earthquake after earthquake after earthquake. Culture is just so wicked, so evil now. It's like they're crying out for something, some fix, some solution. And the only thing that's going to fix it all is November's election. No, that ain't going to fix it, is it? Man's been trying to fix peace in the Middle East ever since there was no peace in the Middle East. And it's going to take God himself to fix that. We're not going to be the ones to fix it. That doesn't mean we don't try. That doesn't mean we don't advocate for it or pray for it. It means we do everything we can. But then when God sets foot... And he says, no more. And then there's peace. That's going to be peace. We should all be going in the same direction as a church. Now, if making disciples is our goal, as a church, as a body of believers, if that's our goal, wouldn't unity make that easier? Or do we all get in a room and we say, well, how do you think we ought to do it? And maybe, just maybe, 
We don't take a vote on how we're going to make disciples. Maybe we just do what Scripture says to make disciples. You know, if we were over in Timothy, talking about, we're talking about Timothy today, but if we were over in Timothy where he says, you can't make disciples from a platform. You can't make disciples from behind a, a pulpit. Oh, well, then I'll move over here and I'll get down here. If I get down here, now I can make disciples? That's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture says, get two or three that are faithful, not just anybody. It doesn't say draw a crowd and then make disciples out of them. It says take two or three and then you three or four people, you make disciples. That will, that verse goes on, make disciples. You find the faithful, you find the ones that are already serving, the ones that are already trying their best to follow scripture and you take those guys and gals and you say let's just us few gather and let's make disciples and then when we're done you go and you get two or three and I'll go get two or three others and then we'll make disciples it's not about a platform it's not about a pulpit it's not even about a church it's about believers doing what God's word says for us to do to make disciples so if we were serious about making disciples we don't need a vote we just need to look at scripture and say how did how did it happen here Jesus took 12 guys aside for three years and he says I'm going to make disciples and then I'm going to send you out and then they went out and they're making disciples and that's where the book of Philippians even came from from one of the people that was poured into way back when and then he made disciples and then those people made disciples to the point where we get all the way down the line to us and some of us we stop the train we just don't make any disciples we say, eh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, all you disciples that sat with Jesus for three years. I appreciate it because I got the news. But I'm not going to do it. <laughs> we're roaring, rowing the other way, aren't we? We're either turning the ship or we're backing it up. We're, we're slowing it down. So if we have the goal of making disciples, we ought to at least want or seek or taste a little bit of unity on that path. Our problem sometimes when it comes to ministry is we make it competition. Well, if you're not the best at whatever it is, however you serve in this local body, if you're not the best, then you can't do it. We're going to have somebody else do it. I told my boss one time when I was in the military, I told him, and I've told you before, but you've forgotten it, so I'm going to say it again. Um, I told him one time, I said, why would you have him do that when you know I can do it better? You know you can depend on me. You know it will be perfect when I'm finished with it. And he said, if you do that, then you're robbing him of the, the, the chance of ever becoming as good as you are at that task. He says, you're stealing that opportunity from him. So it's not about who's best for the job. It's, it's who has God called to do that job in the church, whatever that is, and then doing that job. So sometimes when we see somebody serving in the church and then we get critical and we start, come on. Phil, that's how you play a guitar? I could. Now, y'all know truth here. I can't. I can turn those knobs. One day, one day, I'm just going to turn all these knobs where they line up because I'm OCD that way. And I think that'll work better for him. Y'all probably wouldn't like that. And you'd probably know right off the bat that I had messed with his guitar. He takes that thing. He doesn't leave it laying around. He takes it, locks it up away from me on purpose. 
But we make ministry sometimes about competition. We, we think, well, Phil plays the guitar, but I play it better. I don't know why he's up there and not me. How come, how come Miss Henry plays the organ? Because she's the only one who knows how, right? Raise your hand if you know how. Nobody? Miss Janet? Okay, I got one. I don't know how. I'm not even positive how to turn it on. I'm not sure how to do that. But listen, it doesn't matter if somebody is not the best at something. Well, somebody sings better than this person. So that person should be up here and not that person. Well, that's your judgment, right? God says just make a joyful noise. God says make it worship, not entertainment. So I don't care if the best person is not in the position that, or, or serving in that way in this church. As long as it's serving. As long as it's obedience. As long as it's worship. Then we should be okay with that. But sometimes we get critical of others and then we just start tearing them down. That's not unity. That's rowing the opposite direction. And that tears it apart. It makes everything we do less effective. I only wish that that were the case when it came to making disciples. I wish it was competition. I wish everybody in the church said, I'm going to make more than he makes. I'm going to make more disciples than she makes. That's my goal in life. I'm going to churn them out, baby. I want the awards ceremony at the end of the year to say I made 365 disciples, right? I wish it were that way, but it's not. The problem is these, the, the, the competition part is the problem because that turns us critical about everybody. But we don't see that between Paul and Timothy. Paul and Timothy had unity, not competition. Competition is what's happening in verse 21. You see verse 21? For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. It actually happened in the first century. And Paul didn't fix it with what he wrote all the way back then because we still have the same problems. I can do that job better. I can sing better. I can preach better. No amens there? That's good. Okay, let's move on. Not just those that are in the church was happening. This was happening from the outside. It was happening from the inside. And they were critical about each other. They were seeking their own interests. Remember when we talked about the Sermon on the Mount, when we worked our way through that? Remember some of them were out for their own? They were outside of the church. They were not inside of the church. They were not even believers. The Bible says in the Sermon on the Mount that they came into the fold by another door. They didn't come in through Christ. They came in like a lot of pastors today. They came in for money. They came in for the jet airplanes, for the whatevers, right? And, and they make it a show. They make it unscriptural because they have turned their doctrine away from scripture and towards culture. They want to hear you saying that God wants you all to be rich. I'll tell you right now, some of you couldn't handle the money. You couldn't handle it if you was rich. I couldn't handle it if I was rich, right? If I can't handle properly what God gives me now, what makes you think he's going to let me win the lottery and have millions of dollars at my disposal? That might be dangerous, right? It doesn't work that way. But not only did they have a shared mission, Paul and Timothy had a shared passion. Look at verse 20. For, for I, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. He says genuinely concerned for your welfare. Not just faking it. Not in it for himself. He's in it for them. Verse 21 talks about that, that, um, that I too may be cheered by the news of you. Verse 24 talks about Paul making a visit there. They had a shared passion for people. 
And they had a shared passion for these people, the people at the church of Philippi. They, he wanted to visit him. And he wanted to send Timothy there to visit them. Today, if we love each other, the way Paul and Timothy loved the church there at Philippi, shouldn't we have some sort of unity? Shouldn't we experience some sort of unity? Shouldn't we be more concerned about other people than our own selves? I think, just maybe, we ought to be more like verse 20 and less like verse 21. We ought to be thinking about other people, not about ourselves. True unity is only found in the interests of Christ. Not us. Because there's too many us's. And we all go different directions. We all think, well, we ought to do this as a church. So I'm going to go this way. Well, that's not the way this person's going. That person's going this way. And this other person's going that way. Pretty soon, you just got 15 different directions and you don't know which way you're going. We don't have any unity. If we, if we were uni in unity around the goal of making disciples, then we would all make disciples. So I believe that our church does pretty good when it comes to unity. But not when it comes to making disciples. I don't think we make enough. I don't think we understand how exponential that is. How important that is. So important that Jesus laid out the example for us. In training the few, the faithful, that will train others as well. So, so I think there's always room for improvement when it comes to making disciples. So not only did they have a shared mission and passion, but they also had a proven worth. Look at verse 22. But you know Timothy's proven worth. They already knew Paul's Tim proven worth, right? That's the reason they sent Epaphroditus with the gift in the first place. They said, that guy's got it going on. That guy's going above and beyond. That guy's planting churches. We need to support him so that he can keep doing what he's doing. So they knew his proven worth. And then in verse 22, he says, but you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. He says, they've served together like a close relationship between a father and a son. That they've served Christ together. They've even served the church at Philippi together. And their actions proved it. Their actions proved their worth. If you had to evaluate your actions today, what would they say? What would they say about you? Would they prove your worth or would it teach or show or reveal to you that you're actually going in the opposite direction? That you're not experiencing unity. You've picked your own goal. You've picked your own way and you're doing it your way. Because I don't agree with whoever's there. That's not unity. That's going the opposite way. And we've already seen that that won't work or at least it will make us as a church less efficient. Paul and Timothy had unity because they had a shared mission, a shared passion. And because of that, we see that in their actions. We see the unity in their actions. Now, quickly, let's talk about Paul and Epaphroditus. How about them? We can already see that Paul and Timothy were like-minded, right? How about Epaphroditus? Look at verse 25. He also shared the same mission with Paul. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Their passion was to share the, in the mission of Christ, to serve him and to make disciples. How do we know that they had that? Because of his explanation, how he, how he describes Epaphroditus. Look at this. Now, as we read this piece, I want you to think about a church that would refer to each other this way. He calls him my brother. You know, I think that has been lost in our culture today. We don't call each other brother and sister in Christ anymore. 
do we? Sometimes you'll see somebody say, well, well, Brother Matt, Brother Charles, right? We've lost that. And that sometimes is a reminder to us when we call each other that, brother or sister, that we're actually brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we do that, we actually experience more unity going in the right direction because otherwise... We don't see them as a brother in Christ. We see them as a competitor in the ministry. That's how you get lawsuits within the church. We start suing each other. Well, I don't think of him as my brother or sister anymore. But he calls him my brother. He calls him my fellow worker. If we're all fellow workers, we're not going to criticize each other for what we're doing. We're going, to be, we're going to treat each other like fellow workers. We're in the same goal. We're, we're in the same task. We're in the same goal. He calls him a fellow soldier. If you're a soldier, you fight for that team and no other team, right? That's the way it works. He calls him your messenger. He calls him a minister to my need. Can you imagine that church? That would be a church that has the same mission, the same goal in mind. Paul and Epaphroditus also had the shared passion for people. Look at verse 26. He says, For he, that's Epaphroditus, has been longing for you. The words longing for you, or the word longing for you in the Greek there, is talking about not just I wish I could be there with you. It's not that kind of longing. It's not the kind of longing that Darren Henry thinks about when it comes to Christmas, right? He longs for Christmas. He just wishes it was here. Now, when you hear the Greek definition, you're probably going to say, no, that's me too. The Greek definition of the word here for longing for you is, I need you. I need you. It's a necessity. I have to have you. That's what he's talking about there. That goes above and beyond just, I wish I could be with you. No, he says, I need you. And he needed them and they needed him. Look at at the rest of that verse. It says, and has been distressed, Epaphroditus has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He says, I need my people the same way they need me. That's caused turmoil. It's caused disheartened in his life. He says he's distressed. That's the kind of relationship that they had together. Look at verse 27. He says, Indeed he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but me also. Now he's talking about Paul. He says, Lest... I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul's already limited in ministry, so the Romans thought, because he's uh, he's in prison, per se. And he says, so I have sorrow. But then if, if he had died, if Epaphroditus had died, I would have sorrow on top of sorrow. That's how we go through life sometimes. I have sorrow on top of sorrow, on top of sorrow, on top of sorrow. That's when life falls apart, and we forget who's in control. Because we think we are. That's how you fall victim to sorrow upon sorrow. Is we forget that God's in control, not us. I don't want to do ministry alone. Can you imagine this church? If you expected me to do everything. One, we'd not play any music anymore. We wouldn't sing. Right? And you'd be like, man... How come he can't play the guitar? Because that's not, that's not my goal. That's not my role. That's not my giftedness. I can't do that. So I do what I can do. He says, I don't want sorrow upon sorrow. I don't want to do ministry alone. I can do it, Paul would say. But I need Epaphroditus. I need Timothy to go and do what they do. I need them to pastor churches just like the church at Philippi. Look at verse 30. Epaphroditus was different. He was not the normal pastor. He was not the normal leader. He was not the normal believer. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He says... 
you went above and beyond Epaphroditus and that kind of minister ought to be honored look at verse 29 so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men he's talking about faithful ministers the ones that have a passion for the lost the ones that are faithfully serving he says honor those we don't always do that in church because some of us at times, yes, even in our church, they hang on every word that I say, whether it's in the pulpit or not. They hang on every word, not to learn, not to be under the word of God, but to criticize and to tear down and to, like some of you might do in a few moments, is have me for lunch, is I've, I've heard people call it right that's what we do instead this says for those ones that have a passion for the lost those ones that share the same mission the same goal they ought to be honored as such men those they ought to be in fact scripture says in one place that they should have a double portion somebody told me today I'll, I'll rephrase it but they just encouraged me for what I do and another one I talked to several times already and then they came up and they tapped me on the shoulder and they said I forgot to tell you I love you when we were talking earlier that's the kind of unity that's the kind of encouragement we need when we're talking about ministry and in a couple of weeks when we have our, our, our appreciation dinner that's what we want you to know that's what we want you to understand is that you are appreciated in this church and that part of, of what makes us go is you having an oar in your hand and rowing in the same direction as serving Christ as making disciples and we need every one of you to do that and we need every one of us rowing in the same direction not the opposite direction Here's what I want you to see though. Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, they had a close relationship, didn't they? That's evident here in Philippians. It's evident throughout other parts of Scripture. And, and they had a close relationship. But their relationship came from their unity. Their relationship did not produce the unity. Their, their unity did not come from their relationship. Their relationship was formed on their unity. They all had a like goal. They all had a like passion. And that's what created the unity that they experience. Some of us today. Have you ever wondered why you don't have close friends at church? You've never gotten close to anybody at any church you've ever been in. Maybe, just maybe, it's a unity problem. Maybe, just maybe, you're not a disciple maker. Maybe, just maybe, you don't love people the way they love people. Listen, when we go out to Mission Point Stella, we ought to be in unity. When we go out there and we serve those people, we ought to be, hey, I want to be a disciple maker. You know who disciple makers hang out with? Disciple makers. You know who people that love people hang out with? People that love people. People that care for the lost. People that want to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. That's who they hang out with. You want to come hang out with us out there at Mission Point Stella? Come on. Mission relationships are built or based on our unity not the other way around if you're not a believer today brother Phil I'm going to ask you guys to come the other thing I'm going to ask you Phil is can you change the song to the how great thou art medley you can... I know that throws you off but I'm telling you that's worship if you're not a believer today, you're the purpose for this unity. You're the reason that we have studied it for six weeks. 
You want to know why? Because you can't save yourself. And this book says so. And this book says you need a Savior. And that Savior, this book, tells us who it is. The entire Old Testament points to him. The entire New Testament is surrounded around him. Jesus Christ went to a cross, paid the penalty for your sins and for mine. And he made a way for you to be in heaven one day. All you have to do is accept that and just believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead and scripture says over in Ephesians, you will be saved. It's not based on your effort. It's not based on your relationships or how much unity you had in the church when you were here on this earth. It's based on what did you do with what Christ did on that cross. It all goes back to that point. He's not going to weigh it in the balance when he gets there. When you get to heaven or get between before him one day at the great white throne judgment for for the lost. And he's not going to weigh and say, well, you were in pretty good unity with the church. So I'm going to I'm going to let you in. No, it's all going to go back to the cross. It's all going to go back and say, what did you do with what I did? Because that's the only thing gets us in is believing that Jesus died for you. The reason we have spent six weeks talking about unity is because of you. You need a Savior. You need Him. And believers, we ought to all be about telling you the truth. Not what you want to hear. Not what's based on culture. But telling you the truth from Scripture today.